We laugh. I think we're live. Why is this not working on Instagram here? We're live on YouTube and Facebook. We're not live on Instagram. Crystal normally does this, not me. All right. Oh, here we go. Live. There we go. Now we're cooking with gas. Now we're live on Instagram. Now we're live on YouTube and Facebook. I've got, Crystal's got the camera with her. She's again out of town. So I apologize. The camera is not as good coming from the computer, but it is what it is. How's everybody doing? I'm about to run after this. So I'm drinking a little non stimulant, no caffeine pre workout. I'm trying to see this first time I've had it. We'll see if it's any good. Tastes pretty good. Sour apple. Um, anyways, well, I want to start today off with a discussion around doubling work volume. In I, I said doubling work volume in half the time in that little Instagram story. That may be a little bit misleading. It's probably not going to be half the time, but it's definitely a significant way to double or significantly increase work volume while training. And that is to focus on the negative movement. So if any of you have ever followed around, followed along with Dorian. Yates, um, who is six time Mr. Olympia and a freaking beast. He was like the original mass monster in bodybuilding. He had a style of training called blood and guts training. And basically he would have several rest days in a week because he would annihilate his muscle when he trained it. And he did so by really truly going to failure by leveraging forced reps and negative repetition. So positive repetition, like if you're doing a bench press, for instance, the positive is on the way up. The negative is on the way down. Most people, when they go to lift weights, they haphazardly throw the weight up because they're in their mind, they're just trying to simply lift the weight and they're much less controlled on the way down. They pretty much just let the weight fall, uh, depending obviously on the type of movement. But if we'll just use bench press as an example, if you forcibly, you know, move that weight up in the positive motion, but then you're very haphazard with it dropping, you're not getting near the stimulation that negative movement as possible. And everyone is much stronger in the negative portion of the repetition. It's much harder to go down or it's much easier to go down with a heavy load than it is to go up with a heavy load. So to truly reach failure and increase work volume, workload, you want to really focus on that negative part of the rep. A lot of people do it by breathing techniques. They'll go up with like a one count and then down with a two count. So if I'm doing bench press, you know, one up, like one count if you're doing like second counts. So one Mississippi and then one, two Mississippi. So slower on the way down. Um, that's a good way to kind of really ensure that you're focusing on that negative part of the repetition. And that will significantly increase the, the muscle fiber stimulation on whatever muscle you're trying to work and therefore increase your ability to grow from a hypertrophy standpoint and overall strength development standpoint in that muscle. Um, I've always known this and tried to incorporate it, but it's easy to, to kind of, you know, start going through the motions and forget about it. So this past week, since Crystal's been gone, I haven't had a spotter. Um, I've really just been focusing on that negative part of the, the repetition. And let me tell you, it is not easy. I've noticed I can't do near as many reps when I'm going much more controlled on the negative. Um, but yet I feel with less technical, less volume uh, from a sheer calculation standpoint, because I'm not getting as many reps, I'm getting more true volume because that muscle is getting stimulated significantly more than it would had I not been focusing on the negative. So that's one quick, easy tip to ensure that you're getting more workload in ideally less time. I mean, Probably not less time overall, but you're not having to do a whole bunch of more exercise. You can do the same exercise you're doing currently, just focus more on the negative part of the rep. Um, all right, let's jump into some questions here. We had several people jump on here on Instagram. What's up? What's up? How's everybody doing? I feel bad Crystal's not here uh, to help pull some weight. It's just me again, so y'all are stuck with me and not Crystal. My apologies there. Stephanie says, good vibes. What's up, Stephanie? Throw some questions at me, y'all. What you got? What you got? Wow, does it apply to resistance bands as well? Bicep curls or these movements? Yeah, it applies to anything. Any any 
motion that requires stimulation of that muscle can benefit from focusing on the negative rep. So again, positive is when you're going up, for instance, on a bench press. Negative is when you're going down. And if you really want to focus on uh, reaching true failure, since using the bench press example again, once you reach failure on the positive, you're not going to be able to get that weight up a second or for more repetitions in order to focus on that negative. Because again, the negative is easier. So if you had a spotter that could help you force that weight up so that you're able to focus on the, the negative once you've passed failure on the positive part of the rep, you can go even further and reach true, true failure. Um, that's, that's one benefit of machines. It's easier to do it with machines with like a barbell or free weight, especially if it's overhead um, or like a bench press. This can be a little more dangerous. But if you have a spotter that can help you get the weight up so that you can then focus on, focus on the negative uh, part of the rep, that would be really good. Um, no crystal again. What's up, single savage? <laughs> yeah, she is um, traveling. She is, uh, so her brother flew into town. We painted the house up in Fayetteville. And then she drove him up to Oregon. They're in Oregon right now. Um, they're going to help move him, some of his stuff, to his new house in Washington. He was living in Oregon. Now he's living in Washington. So she's getting a trailer and helping him move some of his stuff to Washington. And then she'll drive back here from Washington. Uh, Keto Carnivore King says, I love negative reps for triceps, especially with a cable machine. Yeah, triceps are good. I always get a really sick pump triceps. Triceps is probably one of my favorite body parts to work, and it's what I'm training tomorrow. I'm curious about what you think regarding people having success on higher protein versus high fat to protein than fat for weight loss. Thanks. I think it's great. I think if they're having success with it, then more power to them. I, I've always stood by the philosophy that there's, no, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I was losing body fat, and I got super ridiculously shredded with very low fat, super high protein, and very low carbs at one point in my life. I don't think that was optimal. I don't think it was certainly not op optimal for me, but I did it. So it's all a matter of what is sustainable, what is truly healthy. As long as your markers are improving, you're enjoying it, and it's sustainable for you, then more power to you. Um, personally, I feel like there's a lot of people that would benefit from a legitimate ketogenic diet that are coming into the space having not done keto before, and they're getting confused because they see all this conflicting information about how much protein one should consume how much fat one could, should consume. If you're, in my opinion, if you're doing a high protein, low fat diet, low carb diet, then you're not really following a ketogenic diet. What you're doing is you're following a high protein, low fat diet. And if that's working for you, fine. But calling it a ketogenic diet is just confusing the masses and not really doing any good for anybody. That's what my video on Monday was about, actually. Um, let's see here. Don't know the topic, but I guess I get some slight calf cramps lately. I know it's electrolytes, but how can how sh soon uh, before I work out should I supplement some added electrolytes or should I supplement intra workout? So great question. I personally have some electrolytes in my pre workout, but then my intra workout drink is electrolytes. So I'm drinking sodium and potassium. I, I do one scoop of Relight with my intra workout water, and that pretty much eliminates any calf cramps. Um, can we talk about proper use of knee sleeves and wraps, when to put them on, take off, etc.? Uh, so I don't use elbow sleeves, but I do use knee sleeves and I only do knee sleeves when I'm doing heavy squats or heavy dead or not deadlifts, but heavy uh, leg press or something like that. Something that's going to load that joint very, very heavily. Um, and what I'll typically do is like when I'm doing squats, for instance, I'll start with the bar. I'll start with body weight. Then I'll start with the bar. Then I'll go to 135. 155, 185, and I put the sleeves on once I get to 185 or 225, and then I put the wraps on once I get beyond 225. Again, that's more than most people do. Most people aren't using sleeves and wraps, but I've found that that works really well for me, and I've never had a knee injury, so I'm going to keep doing it. Um, hello from Little Rock. New to heavy lifting, best tips for newbies. What's up, Jason from Little Rock? We're right, practically neighbors, man. Um, tips for newbies. Uh, focus on form. A lot of people, it's it's really easy to get stuck in this ego lifting mentality when you're going to the gym, you see people doing stuff, you want to see if you can do this stuff, and then the next thing you know, you're trying to lift way too much weight, and you're not focusing on the muscular contraction, you're not focusing on the proper range of motion, you're rocking thing. It's just not good. Uh, so don't care what anybody else is lifting. Focus on what you're lifting, and just do that to the best of your ability. 
uh, and really feel the muscle working. Um, did you find the cow? Yes, we found the cow. So we have a cow now, again, which is good. Uh, so no sleeves needed for just minimal weighted lunges. Yeah, probably not. If you're warmed up and you're not having any knee pain, uh, then you probably don't need the sleeves. The, the sleeves are great for constriction and to keep that joint warm. So if you have a good warm up, uh, like if you do some you know, light cardio, if you do some light uh, leg work before you do your just body weight lunges um, or slightly weighted lunges, then you should totally be fine. If you have some pain or if you're not warm, then you may benefit from putting the sleeves on. Um, Corey Bryant is in Alabama. What's up, Corey Bryant? Jason, thumbs up. You bet, ma'am. Let me see if I got any questions over here. Have you noticed more metabolic flexibility transitioning to keto, meaning I can't get fat as easily but need to go deeper in a deficit too? Um, I have definitely noticed more metabolic flexibility in the sense that I don't feel as hungry as frequently uh, when I'm ketogenic. I don't have to feel uh, so like when you're when you're not metabolically flexible and you're dependent upon carbohydrates and glucose for energy, you're much more subjected to uh, the swings in hunger patterns that come from the rise and fall of your blood glucose and blood insulin. Once you become more fat adapted, you don't have near as big of a swing. So your hunger is much more stable. And that's been the case for me for sure since being keto. Uh, does BCAAs mess up keto? No, it doesn't mess up keto, but I don't know that it's worth the money for branched chain amino acids if you're getting enough protein and overall calories. Um, ideally, when it comes to branched chains, I only really use them as a way to kind of cover my bases and hedge my bets when I'm in a steep deficit. If I'm in a steep deficit, I'll include some branched chain amino acids simply to ensure that I'm getting all the amino acids because I'm not getting enough from the calories and the food that I'm eating because I'm not eating at a surplus. Uh, when I'm in a deficit. So that's the only time I ever even use branch chains. Uh, when clients are cutting, when do you start to implement small refeeds? Um, so generally speaking, I don't implement refeeds, and this is ketogenic refeeds, not carb refeeds, uh, until about the last four or six weeks of a competition prep, depending on how lean they're looking then, you know, when the show is, um, if they are, if they've done the work and are coming in ahead of schedule, then we can start implementing those refeeds a little bit earlier. If they're lagging a little bit, then I might hold off a little bit more on those refeeds. But ideally, having about four to six weeks, six weeks is definitely a long run, but about four weeks um, of refeeds prior to the show would be optimal. I drink electrolytes and aminos throughout the day. Yeah, that would be totally fine. Um, are you doing like a branch chain amino acid, I'm assuming? Do you have the pigs yet? No, we do not have the pigs yet. We're not moved into the house yet. We, we've been going up to the house every weekend, working on it, painting on it, working on the barn, but we're not going to get animals until we're officially moved up there. And since we're moving in July, August, we probably won't get the animals until um, next spring. The cow that I was talking about earlier is our cow, but Chad, Crystal's brother, is going to be watching it with his cow up in Washington State. Um, been trying to know the difference between drusty keto and clean keto. What is drusty keto? Um, dirty keto, I'm assuming that means. Yeah, probably dirty keto. Dirty keto is like just focusing on the macros, not the micronutrients, not the sourcing of those foods, none of that stuff. I definitely recommend putting more emphasis on where your food comes from and focusing on quality if you can afford it. What do you recommend for good stretching regimens? I find between kettlebells and cycling, I'm not as flexible as I maybe could be, feeling a little tight. Uh, so I like dynamic stretches. I'm not really big a, a big fan for static stretches where you just simply hold that stretch for a significant period of time. That can actually cause the muscle to lose some elasticity prior to training it, which is not good. Um, so I oftentimes just do some dynamic stretches. So with kettlebells, for instance, if you're about to do uh, kettlebell squats and uh, some quad work, some lunges maybe, before doing that, do it with just the body weight, but do that exact motion that you're about to do with just the body weight as a stretch as opposed to a working set. Um, Cindy Molina missed a lot of the past two weeks. That's okay. You're here now, so we got you. Uh, what books are you reading? Is it good? I am currently reading uh, a book called F Your Feelings by Ryan Muncy, and it's good. Um, I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson, and he's got a very extensive 
reading list on his website. So I'm going to start reading those books. Also, there's a book called Ravenous that was highly recommended to me. So I'm going to read that as well. I'm pretty sure the author's name is Sam Apple, but don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure it's Sam Apple. Should I eat my last butter maple pecan brick or go with OG peanut butter? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. You might as well eat the last butter maple pecan brick and just savor every morsel of it. Uh, should you cycle once a, in a while or not? Uh, cycle carbs or cycle like bicycle? Um, if bicycle, then yeah, I think that'd be great. Uh, I don't think there's any need to cycle carbs. If you want to, you can. I don't think carbs are villainous, um, but I don't think there's any need to. Appreciate all you do. Wish you much success. Well, thank you very much. I haven't checked since Sunday. Hopefully you said you sold out on all the underpour bricks. So nice you guys offered that. So nothing went to waste. Yes, we did. In about 24 hours, we sold out of those. Um, I use Redcon's uh, Breach with Redmond Relight. I've not heard of Redcon's, but I'll check that out for sure. How do you implement more movement activity walking with a desk job? Whew, I do spend a lot of time at the desk, y'all. I constantly get cricks in my neck from just being at a computer all day long, which is not cool. Uh, I always try and get some movement in. I work out in the morning. I run in the afternoons. And then throughout the day, I'll take a break from the computer and I'll walk the different buildings that we have here, check on the crew, see how the bricks are coming along. You know, sometimes I'll go to the post office with our, uh, with Ellen, who's doing the post office runs. Um, I haven't gone to the post office in a while, though, to be honest with you. But uh, I try and get some movement in for sure. I'll, sometimes I'll go out and I'll shoot my bow and have to walk to get the arrows after I shoot. Just anything to get some movement in. I'd love to get one of those stand-up desks, though. Um, Lori says, what is Crystal eating while on the road? What is Crystal eating while on the road? She has, she got a bunch of keto bricks that she took with her. And she also got several packages of the Keto Explore freeze-dried meals. Those are amazing and they come in super handy when on the road. So pretty much she's living off of those two items right now. Um, if we sign up for nutritional help with you guys, how does it work? Would it be something that you fit our macros according to foods, meats we like? Uh, so it depends if you decide to work with Crystal or if you decide to work with me. We have a similar protocol, but it is different. Uh, she has more of a holistic approach towards like everything, not just nutrition. Mine is definitely more so focused on the nutrition and the training. Um, but yeah, we would both adjust your macros pretty much weekly to get that dialed in. And we give all of our clients a sample meal plan based off of that first week's macros and the foods that you like. But both Crystal and I are not big on consistently dishing out meal plans because nobody ever follows meal plans on a weekly basis. Like if, if, if a client comes to me and says, hey, I want a meal plan, I can make them a meal plan. I make them a sample meal plan. But making a meal plan every single week defeats the purpose of them learning how to manipulate macros to hit target macro goals and really become make the whole process sustainable because you you miss out on having to practice that skill set and learn how to tweak those numbers. So I'm all for doing sample meal plans initially, but I don't recommend uh, and I certainly don't advocate for giving every single weekly an updated meal plan. Um, plans for Father's Day. I don't know. I've got to go back up to the building on Friday to meet with our commercial dishwasher rep. He's going to see about getting us hooked up with a big commercial dishwasher for the new building. They're also putting the sheetrock up this weekend, I believe. So I'm going to go check on all of that. Um, and then my dad is leaving uh, for one of his conferences on Sunday. So depending on what time I get back, I may or may not see him, but I'll definitely get him hooked up with a card and some some gift of some sort and try and get some quality time in with them. My brother's birthday is tomorrow as well, so I got to wish him a happy birthday. Um, you are right. That's difficult. I want to sign up, but I hate weighing stuff. Yeah, weighing stuff is is it's tricky. It's, it's kind of um, tedious for sure when you first start, but once you get the hang of it and you kind of like know what you gravitate to and like, it's pretty easy. Like, like just a minute ago, I, I set aside um, some venison backstrap to eat tonight. And I wanted six ounces. So I grabbed my scissors, had this big long back strap, and I guesstimated where that six ounces would be. And it was literally right on the money. Not a single ounce over, not a single gram over. Put it on the scale, six ounces on the nose, and that was it. So you get pretty good at eyeballing things once you do it for a while. Um, 
What else we got here? Question one. That's all the questions. I'm caught up. Let me take another sip of this pre-workout. It's actually pretty good stuff. I'm impressed by the flavor. Sour Apple. And this is the genius brand non-stem pre-workout that was recommended to me from the Seven Set Sunday newsletter. So I'm gonna, this is my first time trying it. We'll see if it works when I train or when I run and then when I train tomorrow. All right, Michael got a question here. Aside from the fat protein ratio, what is the range of recommended grams of protein per lean mass total mass? Um, so it kind of depends if you're in a building phase or a cutting phase, but a good general rule of thumb for just overall maintenance and health and ensuring that you're getting adequate protein for most people is going to be somewhere around that one gram per pound of lean mass up to 1.5 grams per pound of lean mass, depending again on how much you're training, how much you're trying to improve lean muscle tissue. I personally shoot for about 1.5 grams per pound of uh, total body weight because I don't have a whole lot of body fat even in the off season. If you're, you know, if you've only got 100 pounds of lean mass and you weigh 300 pounds, you probably don't want to base it off of your total body weight. You would want to base it more so off of your lean mass. Um, but if you are relatively lean year round, then basing it off of your total body weight just makes things easier. For sustainment as compared to gaining lean mass. Yeah, so honestly, I mean, closer to that 1, 1 1.2, somewhere in that range as opposed to like the 1.5 and up. <clears throat> I ordered Rari pre-workout crystal suggested. It gives you that creepy skin crawl feel. That's the first time I've used that and felt it. Is that normal? That is normal. Most pre-workouts do. Uh, most pre-workouts give you that uh, itchy feeling and sensation, which I don't like. A lot of people love that, which is just weird to me. I am not a fan of the itchy feeling. Um, I have a quote with gratitude. What's up, Sarah? How are you? Brian, hi. How are you? Uh, thoughts on cold showers and cycling calories for days depending on activity of that day. So I personally prefer to not cycle calories, whether I'm in a training day or a recovery day or an off day. I keep my calories and my macros constant because that's just easier and more sustainable, and it averages out over the course of the week. I prefer that because it just simply removes some of the variability. And again, it averages out. So that's what I recommend doing. Um, but some people, like for instance, if they know they're going to – be likely to eat more during the weekend, then maybe they would benefit from having that structured into their uh, planned macro intake so it's there and they won't deviate from it. How often do you fast? I honestly don't fast that much. I do intermittent fasting uh, every single day because I postpone my first meal until later in the day and I wake up early, um, but I don't really do any extended fasting unless I'm in a pretty significant surplus uh, a really aggressive surplus and I want to do that. Um, fasting is, is great. I think a lot of people over fast and I definitely do not recommend fasting while also being in a caloric deficit because that is just too many stressors on the body to be optimal. Um, lately I have been eating more intuitively. My fat usually is by the between 68 and 72% and my calories enough to keep hitting PRs consistently, have good energy. Do you think I can just go with this? Yeah. I mean, honestly, 68 to 72 percent of your uh, calories coming from fat is right around that one to one ratio if your carbs are low one to one ratio of protein grams to fat grams which is honestly a pretty sustainable maintenance slash slight surplus intake so if you feel great you're hitting prs and that's good by all means keep rocking and rolling at that intake let's go keto brick shoot yeah uh, i don't think i've ever found my optimal fat macro but i do think i'm pretty consistent how many hours is your intermittent fasting? Uh, my last meal is normally around 6 p.m. And my first meal is normally around 10 a.m. Um, I'll have a little bit of heavy cream, like a, a couple tablespoons of my coffee. So it's not a true you know, window that I'm not fasting there because there is a little calories in the heavy cream, but it's very minuscule. So I don't really count that personally. Um, I'm new at keto and trying to figure it out as well as track through the Carb Manager app. I've never used the Carb Manager app, but I've heard good things about it. I use one called My Macros Plus. I like that. As long as you like it and it's easy to, to stick with, manipulate, then by all means use that one. Um, Jason says, I train at night with a trainer to build muscle, but he wants to get in protein late at night. Can we make gains without eating or supplementing post-workout? 
Yeah, generally speaking, if you're eating enough protein and calories and fats throughout the course of the day, you don't have to worry so much about getting it all in post-workout. There's a little bit of controversy there. You know, some research says you do, some research says you don't. For every study that says you do, there's another study that says you don't. Generally speaking, if you're in a surplus, you're taking in adequate nutrition, your body's going to be able to use that throughout the course of the day. So if you're getting it in earlier, you should be totally fine. Um, how much will tricep flat bat wings from weight loss tighten up? Uh, it's just going to depend on the individual. It will tighten up, especially as you build more muscle to fill that void. Um, but I, I couldn't give you like a defined time or circumference tightness because uh, everyone's going to be significantly different there. Uh, what is your take on incorporating a PSMF day a week to reach a goal? I do not like protein sparing modified fast. Um, I did a podcast with Rachel on it. And she has a good approach towards it in that she is having low calorie days, but she is having high calorie days to counteract that so that the, the average caloric intake throughout the course of the week is still solid. That's okay. I'm okay with that. I don't recommend what most people deem to be a protein sparing modified fast day in which you have uh, several days or even just one day, but then the normal days are still very, very low intake. If you're chronically under eating, the last thing you need to do is have a day where you're eating even less. That's my take on that. Trying to also lose some fat and tend not to lose, tend to not lose eating late night. Yeah, I don't like eating super late at night because it messes up my sleep. And then if you have poor sleep, you have poor recovery, which makes building muscle harder, which makes ramping up your metabolism harder. So I'm personally not a fan of eating super, super late. Um, what we got here? No protein sparing, Mata Pass, big smile, yeah. Uh, my sleep schedule, I missed a bunch of them. Um, my sleep schedule is typically from 1 to 9 a.m. Trying to be an early bird again. How would you recommend starting to pivot more towards 12 to 7 a.m.? Honestly, like when I was, when I started waking up earlier, like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. at the latest, um, it, it doesn't feel natural at first. Like you just have to do it enough times for your body to kind of reset at that point and then it just becomes fairly effortless or at least it did for me uh, so just simply doing it for enough time for your body to reset there have you tried the x3 bar yes i do like it for traveling for sure i'm doing crossfit as a workout and i've been told keto might cause issues with having enough energy to burn how do you feel about that that's not the case as long as you're adapted like when you you said you were just getting into keto so there definitely will be a period where your performance likely dips as you start to acclimate to being fat adapted so from a highly glycolytic demanding sport like crossfit you will likely see a dip in performance initially but that is not a long-term thing once you become fat adapted become keto adapted your body starts to use that fat and ketones for energy you're going to be able to perform at a high rate even in those glycolytically demanding exercises and sports so don't worry about that. Just make sure you're getting enough fuel in. Also, do you believe fasted cardio is an efficient is as efficient for fat burning cardio? Um, I like fasted morning cardio because I just feel better when I do it. Again, there's a lot of debate between if fasted cardio makes a difference or not. I feel like it does, but I don't have any scientific literature to point to. But I feel better when I do it. So for me, I prefer it. Low Carb Hustle says, who is better podcasting sidekick, me or Danny? Ooh, that's a good question, man. That's a good question. Who's a better podcast, podcasting sidekick? I think you both have your strong suits, you know, like like da like Danny's got bigger biceps than you, Adam. That's just, that's just I'm, I'm shooting, shooting it straight, man. He's got bigger biceps than you, and I put a lot of emphasis in that, you know, but but you make me smile more than Danny does sometimes with all your jokes, and that, that, that counts for something too, brother. Um, Kiss from a Rose has been ruined forever from for reals. <laughs> yeah, um, the uh, the Kiss from a Rose little meme thing was fun. Trying to lose. Uh, oops, I already read that one. I already read that one. Got caught up on YouTube and Facebook. I'm doing CrossFit and today I finished the workout in less than half the time as anybody else. It's actually embarrassing. Keto is the best. Also, PR and biceps laughing. Yeah, you can definitely do – I mean, bodybuilding is a highly glycolytic sport. Um, I mean, th they say that with keto, you, you should not be able to perform well in that 8 to 15 rep range. 
that's where I stay. I stay in that eight to 15 rep range and I've been keto for six years and I work circles in the gym around the people that are eating carbs and telling me that I can't perform in an eight to 15 rep range. So just get adapted and then kick some ass. Um, Michael says, come down with strep and ketone shot through the roof. Just curious about the cause, uh, if you have any ideas. So you came down with strep throat and ketones shot through the roof. Just that. Why would that happen? Why could that happen? Did your diet change at all? Like, did you eat less food? Did anything else happen? Any other variables besides that? I mean, you're going to have a lot of, um, you know, rush of white blood cells, a lot of, inflammation there acute inflammation usually acute inflammation could cause a rise in blood sugar and a corresponding dip in ketones um so i, I don't know why you would see a, an increase in ketones but that is super interesting super interesting um what's the best tool to calculate my macros to lose weight i may be a little bit biased but i am a little partial to my macro calculator on my website ketosavage.com uh, definitely check that out. I just totally revamped the macro calculator, but don't, and th this is true across the board with anybody's macro calculator. It, it should always be fluctuating. I never give a client a set of macros and say, hey, look, just keep this macro target until the end of time or until you reach the goal because that's just not going to be as efficient. I change macros every single week for my clients, and I think that is the best way to do it. Um, all right, what else here? Do you check, oops, um, suggested pre-workout? I don't know. I'm kind of experimenting with a few different ones. This one that I'm drinking right now is from the Genius brand. I think that's what it's called, the Genius brand, and it's a non-stimulant pre-workout. I haven't, this is the first time I've ever tried it, though, though, so I can't say if it's good or not. Uh, do you check that you're in ketosis through blood tests? Uh, I used to when I first started, uh, and I'll still do a random blood test now, but I, I know based off of how I feel, that I'm definitely in ketosis. Um, I feel annoying with my questions. Don't, don't, don't be, in, you're not annoying at all. Keep them coming. How often do you keto brick or recommend amount of keto sweet treats daily? So I definitely do not consider a keto brick a sweet treat. There are, we don't add any sweetener to it. There's a little bit of stevia in the protein powder in it, but as far as keto sweets go, the keto brick is definitely on the complete other end of the spectrum. Like I consider the keto brick a performance product and I eat one of those every single day. Um, so yeah, that's my that's my take on the keto brick. With the sweet stuff, you know, like if it's my whole take on nutrition is there's a risk benefit with everything that you do in life. If you've reached the goal and you're happy with where you're at and you're not trying to reach a goal more efficiently, or because you, you've already reached it, then you can have a little more flexibility in the stuff that you allow into your diet if you choose to. Um, if you haven't reached the goal, then I would minimize those things that you know aren't contributing toward towards you getting to that goal. Uh, so that's kind of my take on the sweet treats. Um, I think I was annoying with questions today too, but thankfully he answered them all. Yeah, the questions are good. I mean, that's what this, this is all about. Um, I do have to go run and cook a steak though, so I'm going to go do that. I appreciate y'all jumping on. Hopefully I'm not super boring with Crystal not being here. She should be back next Wednesday, hopefully in time for the live. So hopefully it'll be the dynamic duo next week when we jump on here. Thank all y'all again for jumping on. Thanks for the questions, and I will see you next time. Adios, toodaloo. Take care for now. Ta-ta.